I'm not sure how your morning goes, but in the Elmer household, we begin almost every day with the same question. Did you have any dreams? And we have so much fun just kind of unpacking and talking and listening to everybody's dream. That is, if we can remember what we dreamed, but it's especially fun as a parent to sit down and ask your kid that question and just listen to what they dreamed. And, and we've come to realize that the Skylers and the Stephanies in, in our dreams are very different than the Skylers and the Stephanies um, in real life, right? As Stephanie and I have, have had years just kind of talking about this, we've realized that the Skylers and the Stephanies in our dreams... <laughs> They're kind of jerks, right? The Skyler in real life, he is so, never mind. I, you know, I've always been fascinated by dreams. A- in my high school, uh, we had to take a psychology class, and one of the projects in our class is we had to keep a journal beside our bed. And, and as we uh, kept this journal, we would, when we would wake up, the goal was to write down our dreams as soon as we remembered it. And if you were to open my journal, you would, if you would look at my writings early in the morning, late at night, you would look at this and go, this looks more like hieroglyphics written by a blind dog with a broken leg than a human composing his own deep inner thoughts. And anyways, we, we would take our dream journals uh, and at the end of the week and we'd bring it to class and then we would psychoanalyze our dreams. I mean, it was a super fascinating experience uh, to do, even if my teacher was kind of off her rocker a time or two. And even today, I love processing. I love psychoanalyzing my dreams. I mean, do you ever do this? One reoccurring dream that I have when I'm under a lot of stress and anxiety is I have this dream where I am moments away from walking up onto this stage to preach. And I, and I, I literally, I'm uh, moments away and I either didn't finish my sermon, I'm not prepared, my iPad breaks, or in the, I'm in the middle of a sermon and people just begin to leave. And I wake up with this jam-packed feeling of anxiety. I I wake up from these these dreams, and I I tell Stephanie my my dream, and then I think, huh, I must have been pretty stressed out from some of the things in my life. And uh, Some people, uh, especially in school, uh, they have these dreams where they have an assignment they forgot about for years. Right? When you have a memorable dream, good or bad, it can capture our imagination for, and our attention for days and weeks and years afterwards. It can shape our moods, it can influence our goals, and sometimes it can even solve age-old problems. We can go from feeling one way to feeling the opposite the next day. Dreams um, can at times have a powerful effect on us, and it's not surprising that many people today seek to deconstruct the meaning behind their dreams through the lens of psychology. But it's, it's equally not shocking that when God wanted to communicate to his people, he does so in the, the innermost personal and imaginative ways like dreams. In a world that is saturated in psychology, we tend to view dreams as a window into the subconscious, revealing our inner thoughts, our inner feelings, our inner visions, our inner hopes, and our inner insecurities about our life. But did you know that for the biblical authors, they often saw dreams not as a window inside of themselves, but as a window inside of a heavenly dimension of our world. Dreams and vision for the ancient Near East was seen as the way in which the gods would communicate with humans. There was this sense that By shutting down your physical senses, it opened up your spiritual vision. And as odd as this may seem to you and to me, that is the backdrop to King Nebuchadnezzar. So we pick up our story in Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, first, uh, important detail is Daniel cues us in to uh, the fact that this was in the second year of Nebi's ruling. Uh, according to the way that the dating worked back then, um, the first year of a king's reign would be kind of the year zero. This was the year of their ascension. So this is called the ascension year. Why does that matter? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me go ahead and tell you. 
If this is Nebi's second year, counting it as, you know, from z- year zero, one, and two, it is technically speaking a span of three years, which is important because Daniel was undergoing training for three years. So this whole dream thing Nebi experiences happens right after Daniel, from what we can tell, graduates with a Babylonian bachelor's degree. This is meant to have, a, have us imagine Daniel as kind of being new on the job with a major crisis on his hands to resolve. This is what you call um, a sink or swim situation, a getting thrown into the deep end of the pool. So let's continue. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Nebi was jolted awake with beads of sweat streaming down his body. His heart is racing, and he cannot go back to sleep. Uh, As parents, we call these with kids night terrors, right? This is what is happening here. But contrary to having just a bad dream because, you know, you ate a, a bad burrito or something like that the night before, this is a divinely sent message to King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, continuing in verse 2. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. Uh, keep in mind, no one is trying to kind of psychoanalyze the king's dreams. Uh, to them, Uh, It was clearly understood that this was a divinely sent message. And when a dream comes to somebody as high in a position as a king, I mean, there's no question, this is divine in origin. Stakes are high. And everyone everyone feels, everybody sees this. And so Nebi is thinking, rightly so, that if a God is communicating with him, it has to do with his kingdom and his leadership. Uh, In verse 3, we see just how high the stakes are. And the king has said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said uh, to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Right? This is the respectful way that you address a king if you want to keep living. Right? Uh, He continues, tell your servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. Uh, This is in line with their job description. They're trained to read books, stars, and unusual events, spend some time thinking and conducting rituals, and then providing an interpretation. But never was anybody ever expected to start from a blank canvas. I mean, they always had something to work off of, and so they asked for, you know, a little bit of assistance from the king. (laughs) What's your dream, king? Here's what he said in verse 5. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruin. Can you imagine being there and hearing this? I mean, it would be a heavy load Um, just to interpret a dream and then to kind of have to figure out what in the world that dream was. Like, oh yeah, like not only do you need to tell me what my dream is, but you need to tell me what that dream means. Like, or you're going to be as good as dead. That's crazy. And and some scholars have just kind of have guessed that maybe Nebi kind of forgot what his dream was. And so that's why he put that out there. But very few actually buy into that. But I find that kind of funny, and I I, I like to think of it that way. But the king is not just troubled. He's also angry. And he he certainly doesn't want to uh, fall into the hands of of those who can manipulate this fragile state the king is in. And so he's suspicious. And he wants to make certain that the person with the explanation is the person who is the real deal. The big problem is the task presents itself as impossible. Nobody can do this. Nobody can accomplish that. And that's why the counsel from the Chaldeans, from the Babylonian wise men, is to respond with these words in verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, 
There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands. So no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Uh, Translation, to be able to provide that level of explanation requires only one thing. A person who has a God who is accessible to them, right? Who has a relationship with him, which um, not one of them has, nor did anyone in Babylon believe that the gods were that accessible. So they, in essence, tell the king, uh, you're out of your mind, right? Thanks, but no thanks, which is frustrating for the king because, you know, he gets no resolve, he gets no sleep, and, and he's told by people who are inferior to him that, hey, you're a little bit ridiculous, And so he has the best of the best standing before him, and they don't have an answer. So in anger, he thinks, well, time to start over with a clean slate, with a brand new batch of wise men. Execute them all, right? Daniel chapter 2, verse 12. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and he commanded that all wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Uh, This is what you call extraordinary measures. I mean, they can't meet his demands, so all the wise men, not just them, all the wise men are to be exterminated. Now, this is a troubling dream that now troubles the residents of Babylon, which includes on that roster Daniel and his friends. So what do you do if you are Daniel? What do you do if you're brand new on the job and then you are faced with an extraordinary time like this. Well, if you're taking notes, here is our key idea moving forward. Extraordinary times requires supernatural wisdom. Extraordinary time requires supernatural wisdom. This situation for Daniel is truly an extraordinary situation. For starters, he could die and, and, and he was never once consulted about the situation, right? I mean, this is kind of a rude awakening for this guy. Uh, maybe it was because uh, he was newer in the game, right? Kind of younger than everybody else. But I mean, still, right? The verdict gets sent out, exterminate all the wise men. And, and Daniel's not once asked to be in the room. And so Daniel's likely reclining with everybody, uh, all of his friends in the room, and all of a sudden, you know, the, 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 somebody starts pounding on his door. You know, the hinges holding the door begin to rattle like an earthquake. And lo and behold, it's one of the king's men, not with a riddle to resolve, but a ruling to be executed. And so Daniel, needing to act fast, requests to take the matter directly to the king. I mean, what in the world are you going to say as you are walking to the king? I mean, moments away, you have minutes, and you got to think of the right words to pacify this angry king who has your head on the chopping block. What in the world do you say? Uh, The text doesn't tell us how that interaction with Daniel and the king went other than mentioning it was successful. My hunch is that First, God granted to Daniel favor with the king in the situation. And and Daniel probably didn't insult the king like these other um, wise men did, right? And so Daniel is given an extension to figure out the king's dream and its meaning. So what does he do? Let's continue in our story in verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his, and his companions. He told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. What does Daniel do? Well, he does four things. And these four things, I think, are critically important for anybody who is needing wisdom in extraordinary times. Uh, Here's what those four things are. First, he goes to the king. He goes directly to the king. And then, second, he gets his band of brothers together to reveal the situation. He confides in them. And as a community... 
they pray to God together. And finally, they worship God in response to what God says. So we'll break this down and kind of tease this out about how and why this should impact our own lives. But first, we should appreciate a detail that is often hidden in this passage and not often talked about. Uh, this passage, no doubt, has an odd dream in it. Um, this is a hu- there's this huge statue made of gold and silver, bronze, and, and then this mixture of iron and clay. And this statue, it symbolizes Nebi's power in kingdom. And the image of these four parts of this statue become a very important detail as we progress through the book of Daniel, especially in Daniel chapter 7. But for now, what's important is that this large statue, a metaphorical image of the king and his authority and his power, has this vulnerable spot on his feet. And he gets struck with this rock that symbolizes the kingdom of God and the whole thing comes crumbling down. Uh, Very interesting gene. Most people, however, when talking about Daniel chapter 2, they miss the bigger picture of its message because they get too focused on this dream. While the dream in the story is very important, while it is very important, it is not the main focus of the story. Most commentators will point out that the bigger point being hammered home in Daniel chapter 2 is a sort of battle that goes on between the wisdom of Babylon and the wisdom of God. In, in fact, the, word, the words wise men and wisdom occur some 13 times in this passage. And the words to reveal and to know and to have knowledge occurs a total of 25 times. Front and center is not What is this dream about, but which wisdom is superior to the other to interpret it? Who is able to actually reveal this mystery? And all the training, all the education, and the gods of Babylon, they can't do it. So who's superior? The wisdom of Babylon or the wisdom from these Hebrew slaves? That's the plot. Who is more qualified? Who is more suited for the king? And the Babylonian wise men, they show their cards right up front. This is impossible. No one can do it. We neither have the training nor the experience to do this. But here's the deal. Daniel, he doesn't either. He does not have the training for this. He doesn't have the knowledge. He doesn't have the experience to do this either. But what sets Daniel apart from everybody else is his God. Even in exile, The God of the Bible is approachable. And so when Daniel goes before the king and tells him his dream, he reveals its meaning and its message. And he broadcasts through the palace and down the dirt roads of Babylon that he has a God that that the God he believes in is a God of wisdom. And his wisdom is far superior than the wisdom in Babylon. And so in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel helps us as readers understand how Daniel and his friends rose to such a prominent and powerful position in Babylon. So that's the big picture of this chapter. But what doesn't get talked about much is is the fact that the God of the Bible is not a God who is removed and unapproachable. This is a God who is in the midst of his own people in Babylon. And the Babylonians, they don't have a God like this that they can approach with questions like this. They don't, they don't picture God in a, in a the, the, the Hebrews don't picture God in this way that he's far removed and uh, distant from them and unmoved by human situations. Now the picture we have in scripture is that we have a God who is involved with his people, who can be prayed to, who can be approached, and we could expect for him to act and respond. He is a God who Jeremiah um, put it like this in Jeremiah 29. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The basic understanding of these so-called gods of Babylon, if they exist, right, is, is that they're not our friends. They're not our allies. They are to be feared and worshiped to kind of keep them off our back so they don't so we don't get their wrath. 
And, and many people think God operates like this, right? I mean, do all these good things, these good behaviors, and, and God won't punish you. But if you, if you don't shape up, then you better be afraid, right? The, the God of the Bible is not like that, right? The God of the Bible, according to Daniel, is he is not somebody who is removed, but a God who is with us. A God who has made himself approachable to his kids, even when they have acted up and they have fallen out of line. And this sets Daniel and these wise men in categorically different places, right? The wise men, they go to the books, whereas Daniel goes to his God. The wise men, they search for wisdom, whereas Daniel goes to the one who reveals mystery, the one who alone is wise. Wisdom for Daniel is not about what you know, it's about who you know. And the beginning, middle, and end of wisdom in Scripture is fundamentally about who you know over what you know. It's about a relationship with God. And this, to me, is what sets the God of the Bible um, over and makes him different from every other religious position, right? Our God is a God who wants a relationship with creation. He is a God who created humans in his own image. And he seeks us out when we go into hiding, and then he develops a plan to restore us back to him when we have gone too far to save ourselves. And this is so much the case that when the Gospel of John was unveiling to us who and what exactly Jesus is, uh, who he is and what he came to do, he used the Greek word logos. In, in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. This gets translated as word. And what's interesting is that in the Old Testament, the word logos and wisdom were often used to refer to the same thing. That somehow how God's wisdom in word was involved with the creation of the world. And, and John tells us that God's word, God's wisdom, God's logos, is, it's not a concept, it's a person. And that person is Jesus. And so for lack of better words, wisdom himself came to earth to make his dwelling among us. That's the heart of God. That's what Daniel gets. Right? That's what Daniel understands. And so what does Daniel do? You know, first, he realizes that the problem he's facing is a problem with the king. And so what does he do? He goes directly to the king. Right? Afterwards, here is his response starting in verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions. The next thing after Daniel addresses the issue with the king is he goes to his friends and he confides in them about the situation. What is funny is that oftentimes people do this in the reverse, right? In an attempt to solve any issue with people, they, they kind of get this the other way around. Most people will first go and talk about their problems that they have with somebody to all of their friends before they go and they try to resolve it and straighten things out with the person they have a problem with. The problem is that never works, right? Most of the time, it just prolongs the issue and it affirms what somebody else already thinks. And that's why Daniel, before he goes to the king, he seeks out an unbiased opinion about the matter and then he goes to the king. He makes sure he gets his facts straight And then after that, he goes to his friends. But it doesn't go to them to complain. No, he goes to them to confide in them. He makes the situation known to them. And here is the ultimate goal of telling his friends what is going on. Verse 18. And told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. So that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Did you catch that? He goes to people who are godly people who will do the wisest things that anybody can do, pray. And so when you find yourself in an extraordinary situation, Daniel's pathway toward wisdom is look into all the facts, address the problem with the person you have the problem with, and then go and confide in a few godly people who will devote themselves to praying for you and praying with you. The wisdom of Babylon says, 
You're in an extraordinary situation. So use your words to tear down the reputation of that leader. And then go tell everybody else how smart you are and how right you are and how dumb and misguided they are so that as many people as possible know. And so Daniel tells his friends, and they devote themselves to seeking God's mercy. They're committed to praying. And here is how this approachable God responds. Verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. God gives them the answer they needed. And in response, they worship God. Daniel praises God for his good, for how good he is, for how wise he is, and how powerful he is. But Daniel doesn't just say this in prayer. He also proclaims this in front of the king, right? Starting in verse 27. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mystery. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in your bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have, a.k.a. this didn't come from Babylon, more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Daniel worships, and then he gives glory to God in private, before his friends, and in front of the king. I mean, this is powerful stuff. And so when you find yourself in an unexpected, um, out-of-this-world kind of situation, we should consider doing the same things that Daniel does, right? Here's what Daniel does. He goes to community. He confides in them. He goes to God, and he seeks God's wisdom, God's help. He prays, and then he worships. We need a community of believers in our life that can speak truth into our lives, but more importantly, that can be lifting us up in prayer before God. We need to realize that the wisest thing that people can do is to seek God. The best way that we can seek God as Christians is to read His Word, to get in Scripture, and to be in prayer. We don't have to wonder who God is because He's revealed Himself in His Word. But seeking God is not just about knowing some facts about God. It is also about communicating with Him, right? Prayer. And regardless of the answers that we have uh, or the outcome that comes of it, our response should always be in worship. So Daniel, in the face of an extraordinary time, he seeks supernatural wisdom through community, through God, and worship. And as a result, guess what happens? He rises above everyone else. Daniel rises to a high place of prominence. But here's the kicker. Daniel not once drew attention to himself. He didn't pat himself on the back. He he never claimed to be the wise guy in town. He proclaimed God to be the wise one who reveals mysteries. And by Nebi putting Daniel in a position of authority, what is really happening is that God... In a very chaotic, disordered, violent, and pagan empire like Babylon, it was actually being run and ruled by God himself. I mean, the so-called gods of Babylon, they are being dethroned at their own game. What a turn of events. But before we close out our sermon today, I want to draw our attention to one last detail in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, The edict that went out from the king of Babylon was to eliminate all of the wise men. And this put Daniel and his friends in the most unique place of influence and power. They had all the influence, all the power at the tips of their finger. And after they interpret the king's dream, and they know that God is going to answer their dream, after, at the tips of their fingers, 
They could have requested the king to do anything and anything that they wanted. And you would think that they would have done everything in the power to save their, to save their own skin and allow these wise men of Babylon to just go ahead and be executed. I mean, these guys are not only, you know, polar opposite of Daniel and his friends, they are literally enemies who will try to kill Daniel and his friends. And we see this in the very next chapter. They are the enemies. I mean, it would have made perfect sense to make the request to spare, uh, to spare Daniel and his friends, and, and then these people, you know, go ahead and continue your verdict. Go ahead and execute them. That is not what Daniel does. Verse 24. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy me and my friends. No. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Before Daniel even gets to the king, he puts up everything on the line, not for his own skin but for everyone, including his enemies. I mean, this is a very Christ-like act. And given what we know about Christ in the New Testament, that he is the incarnated wisdom, the word of God from the Old Testament, it makes sense that those who are living with the wisdom of God would reflect a Christ-like character and to do what is even in the best interest of their own enemies, just like what Jesus did, right? The wisdom from Babylon is is one of anger. It's one of jealousy. It's one of power and violence. And the wisdom of God is one of love and self-sacrifice and humility and peace. Now, it doesn't take long to realize that we're living in some pretty uh, tumultuous times, some divisive times as a country. I mean, it's, it's a pretty extraordinary time that we are living in, isn't it? And the message that has saturated virtually everything sounds strangely similar to the Babylonian wisdom that we find in Daniel chapter 2. A message that whatever news channel you are listening to or watching or whatever political position it is coming from, I find that it's filling people with greater anger and self-preservation and violence and a desire to have as much control possible on on both sides. And And I just have to say that if the script that we are buying into is causing you greater fear, greater insecurity toward your circumstances or greater anger and hate toward your neighbor, then you are reading from the wrong script conservative or liberal, friends and family. We, we may be a few thousand years and miles removed from the historical city of Babylon, but the sad reality is very few people have actually left Babylon. The solution we will find will not be on the news. It, it won't be coming from the Oval Office. It won't be found through riots, boycotts, or social media crusades. The solution is found in one place, better yet, one person, and his name is Jesus. He is the supernatural wisdom that we need in this extraordinary day. And it is this wisdom that creates dreams not of disorder, but dreams of peace, of equality, of love, of unity, and of truth. Dreams were and still are a powerful way to communicate truth. Dreams have a way of capturing our imagination and our attention for days and weeks and years afterwards. It's one of the reasons why one of the most memorable speeches in American history began with these words, I have a dream. I think that what God wants most from his church is to be the kind of people that when the world looks at us, it leaves people dreaming about what the world would look like if there was more people, if there was more Christ, if there was more people living out the wisdom of God. 
more little Christ walking around. But for that to happen, it requires us, like Daniel, to get on our knees, pray to God, pray to the all-wise God for mercy. So let's be those who lead the way as we read a different script than the Babylonian script. Hey, thanks so much for joining us online. Uh, as many of you know, we've kind of opened back up our in-person worship gatherings. And there are all kinds of changes that we have made to ensure that this is a safe and a sanitary place to worship in. And last week and this week, we've had a great experience together. And I'm grateful for being able to open back up. But I'm also grateful for technology like this so that we can still be connected with you. Do me a favor, uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you found today's message uh, helpful, could you just share the message with somebody else? We would love to get the word out that Jesus is the solution to our world's problem. I would like to let you know that we have created a QR code that you can scan and it will take you to our digital connection card. A QR code is, is like a barcode. Uh, those who have smartphones, you can uh, search the QR code and you would be able to download it in the app store to scan it and then fill out our digital uh, connection card. If you don't have one, uh, like a smartphone, or this whole thing just confuses you, you can simply type in this address into your internet browser and it will pull it up. The reason we're doing this is because we want to know how we can be praying for you, uh, if you feel God leading you to make any spiritual decisions, or if you are a guest visiting with us. I would also encourage you to continue to give to the church. Uh, giving is first and foremost an act of worship. It is us patterning our life off of the God who has given us everything for us. And there are many ways that you can keep uh, giving to the church. There's a giving button on the website that will take you to our church's PayPal account. You can give that way. You can also do it through mailing in a, a check or cash, stopping by the office if you are in town, or setting up auto payment through your bank. As you can imagine, a lot happens in 12 weeks. And with a, a heavy heart, I am sad to announce that over the course of this time, we have lost several very loved members of our church family. I'm happy to announce their graduation into heaven, but I am heartbroken that they're no longer present with us. And I'd like just to take a moment to remember, remember our beloved friends, family members, and saints who have gone home. Uh, Don Snyder, Pauline White, Mary Curley, and Elsie Call. I want to just take a couple moments of silence and, and honor them and, and remember them. If you wouldn't mind, let's join in, in prayer as you can lift up the families. Father, I, I lift up um, all of the families who, um, God, who have had suffered loss um, throughout this time. Uh, Father, the, the church, as the church, we haven't been able to gather together and, and encourage one another like we would like to and support each other. And Father, I just ask that you would um, give uh, each of these families the strength they need. Father, I ask that um, your presence would fill up um, the absence that they are feeling um, in this time. Father, we ask that your spirit would lead them, God, that you would, your spirit would guide them, that you would uh, uh, give them the strength in this season that they're in. Father, we thank you for the examples of faith that we have and all the men and women who have um, gone home to you. We thank you for the memories and it's in. This coming Wednesday, I am sharing an interview that I did with Dr. Gary Zustiak on loneliness and depression. Gary is the counseling professor at Ozark Christian College. A, a couple of fun facts about Gary. Uh, Gary is from Oregon, where I'm from. He's also one of the first professors that I met 
in the Joplin, Missouri area at Ozark. He's also uh, one who built up the counseling program from the ground up at Ozark. We talk about the issues of loneliness and depression, um, uh, sites to recognize it in yourself, um, what to do if you have it, and why in the world is it growing so much among the younger generations. I mean, this is a very much needed conversation to have, and it's going to air next Wednesday on Facebook at 10 a.m., or you can listen to it on our podcast by simply searching Unpacked with Skylar on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Look, we look forward to seeing you soon, and we hope that you have the best week possible. God bless.